Okay, yeah. so if you have knee osteoarthritis, are considering surgery, maybe you've gone through a joint replacement or are just on the fence about it, I am so excited for this episode. So the whole point of this podcast is to bring you information about osteoarthritis, but also real life experiences of people who have osteoarthritis and are at varying stages. So you can see how other people are experiencing this condition and what other people are doing for it. Today is a first because I have with me Ms. Dina Pittman, who is the disabled gardener on Instagram. So you may have seen her over there, but she actually just went through a total knee replacement. And she's going to share her experience through that, some of the things that she's used in her recovery and how that has looked for her. Now, please keep in mind that everybody's experience with a joint replacement is going to be different. And we are going to talk about that a little bit too. So please keep in mind that it does depend on the person as far as recovery time. As I was a home care physical therapist working with people that had total knee and hip replacements, there is a lot of different so please keep that in mind, but we're going to talk about some tips and tricks that have helped her through because she just took an amazing trip overseas and we're going to talk about that too. But Miss Dina, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you, Alyssa, so much for having me on your podcast. I'm really excited and I hope we can help give um, some of your listeners some clarity if they are on the fence about whether to have a total, any joint replacement or not. Yes because it is a big decision and there's a lot that goes into weighing the decision. And that's one of the first things that we're gonna hop into here. But unfortunately, I find that a lot of people kind of go into it not knowing really what to expect not knowing kind of what it's going to look like on the other side. And right. so let's kind of dive right into first, what made you go into the decision of getting a total knee replacement? And we'll kind of start there. I know it may be a little bit long story. That's okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. Um, my knee actually um, was always kind of secondary to me as far as my arthritis pain because I always had back problems. And uh, so I have back and neck and hand and foot arthritis. That always really bothered me kind of more than the knee did. And um, the knee's been chronic. Um, I would say, so like 10 years ago, we got the lot that we're on now and we're on a one and a half acre lot. And it was my dream to turn that into like a, a park-like setting, you know, sure. with, uh, I wanted vegetable gardens and fruit gardens and an abundance of flowers. I just wanted it all. And I kept getting injured every time I tried to go out and do some of the major work. And so I noticed I was going through this cycle of, um, x-ray, MRI, and physical therapy for all the major joints. And sometimes it was my knee that was that I was doing it for. And so uh, I was thinking about it. And it's possible that my knee arthritis started um, when I was in my 20s, I had an injury uh, to my knee. And um, I had joined the army. So I was in the army. And I was in basic training. And um, back then, I hope it, that it's improved now, but back then they, they gave, uh, this was in the 80s, they gave the women the same combat boots as the men. So they were just oh, wow. smaller sizes. Yeah. And so they were, the boot was too wide for most women's feet sure. and they just didn't fit very well. And so I remember one training exercise where I actually slipped and I hurt that knee really bad. Um, but it was basic training. So if the leg wasn't broken, you, you just got to keep going. going. <laughs> yeah. So it is possible. I mean, that knee has really bothered me off and on since I okay. was in my early 20s. So it is possible that the injury did start the process of arthritis, but it, that doesn't really explain the rest of my body. So <laughs> 
Um, but again, it was just seems like the knee has not been as severe a problem as my back has over the years. Okay. And so, um, but I've always gone to the ortho, like for the, the last six years or so, I've gone to the ortho twice a year just to kind of stay in the loop um, for my knee. And uh, sometimes I'd get steroid injections and sometimes hyaluronic acid injections, okay. sometimes both. And um, those injections, I, I never felt like I got like a huge amount of relief from those, but I kept going to see the ortho just because I kind of want to stay in that loop. And then uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, and this is a long story, but a couple of years ago, that's okay. I, I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> I did injure that knee again out in the garden, and I injured it pretty bad this time. And it was uh, I couldn't walk for a couple of days, and so that was unusual for it because usually it it I would say pain levels stayed like chronic pain between three and six. Okay, but. But the knee never really, except every once in a while, like I'd stand up and all of a sudden there'd be this 10 pain, but it wouldn't last. Okay. And so it was just like, yeah, do I really need to do something about this? I can tolerate this. But then I had that injury and um, I did go in and saw the surgeon and I wanted an evaluation for replacement back then. And he actually did some tests and he said, um, this, I don't think this is your knee. I think it's your back. And he said that there was something happening in my back that was causing me not to be able to walk properly and feeling that pain. And um, they were like, we have to figure out what's wrong with your back before we can do your knee because you wouldn't be able to do the physical therapy. Sure. So, um, but we never found anything wrong with my back other than you've got arthritis, you've got degenerative joint disease, you know, there's maybe a bulging disc and that sure. kind of thing. So okay. it, it's kind of uh, put that on the back burner for a while. And um, I didn't really consider going back in to be evaluated for knee surgery for a while. So, um, in the last couple of years, though, the knee has really kind of stepped up its game. It's like, didn't want to be outdone by the back. So <laughs> it's like, no, give me all the attention. Yes. And, um, it might have something to do with the fact that I have triplet grandchildren. And so um, taking care of, you know, or helping to care. I am for sure. Toddler times three. Three, really right. Goes to where your weaknesses are real fast. So um anyway i had um and also about a year ago i found your program and i i uh, did the started the arthritis blueprint program and i kind of had a renewed commitment to i am not going to get uh, surgery i'm not yeah. going to get any replacement i'm going to do what i can to make this thing last <laughs> absolutely so, um but there was something in one of those um times that I went to see the ortho, it was the PA, um, the PA was looking at my x-rays and looking at the leg length study. And he was saying, well, you know, when the surgeon goes in there to replace your knee, they can fix this deformity. And I was like, wait a minute, you're saying I'm deformed? And <laughs> started thinking about that. And what all does that mean? And um, Anyway, I was uh, kind of mulling that information and um, I was thinking if, if my leg is deformed because the joint's kind of collapsing down on itself, uh -huh. um, is that causing the other joints to have undue stress on them? And uh, I was starting to have a lot of hip problems and uh, so... <clears throat> Anyway, I, I just kept thinking about this and the surgeon's answer to that question was yes. And actually he said that when we did this knee replacement, it's possible that it would correct enough of that deformity that um, it would postpone having the other knee done. He didn't say that we wouldn't have to have the other knee done, but he said sure. it would yeah. And um, my um, medical care is through the VA and the VA was very good to always tell me um, that 
a knee, knee replacement, unless you've had some kind of tragic accident, a total knee replacement is an elective surgery. Mm -hmm. And no one should ever tell you that you have to have knee surgery because you're the only one who can make that decision. And I love that. Yes. Yeah. They, they were great about that, but in a way it makes it harder for you because because you just want someone to tell you what to do and say, exactly. you know, you need to do this. Exactly. Yeah. And you're just kind of stuck in this limbo of, I don't know if I should have this done. And it's, it's a big displacement of your life and other people who are helping you their lives to actually have this surgery. So, um, but I was thinking about the things I do in the garden and the grand things I do with the grandkids. And um, I thought, you know, when I move, I'm constantly um, trying to avoid pain. And so maybe a lot of this chronic pain that I have in my knee is not, it, it doesn't get up to that severe level because I'm super careful and guarded with my knees and not letting it as much as I possibly can prevent that. Yeah. So uh, that kind of got me thinking about it and wondering if, if the knee being deformed is actually causing a lot of my back problems and the back to be out of whack. And I didn't want the hip to start, you know, getting arthritis. <clears throat> and so anyway, I also was thinking not all joints can be replaced. Like, um, you know, I would love it if they could go into my neck and pop those vertebrae out and just put a new one in, but that can't happen the way it can with a knee. And so um, kind of all of those, also just the fact that I'm, I'm young and I can still heal pretty fast and I can, phys I'm physically able to do the physical therapy. And uh, all of those things kind of are what came into my decision to go ahead with the knee surgery. Sure. So basically it was to, to correct the deformity um, to prevent further deterioration of other joints and um, to do it while I'm young enough to heal and also just to replace something that can be replaced. It can be fixed. Right. So, and it sounds like it was also limiting quality of life as far as being able to garden, you know, constantly feeling like you're moving, you know, on a, you're walking on eggshells. And I the funny thing is, is you don't realize you're doing that. Right. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. 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 And I mean, and this definitely highlights that it is more of a complicated decision versus, you know, hey, you need a knee replacement. Okay, let's do it. There's a lot that goes exactly. into being the decision. And I'm sure, you know, I would hope that they, you know, explain the risks and that there are some things that could happen as far as in the recovery, which we'll talk about the recovery. But I do want to kind of highlight the fact of this essentially, it sounded like this decision stemmed off someone being told or someone telling you that your leg is deformed and it's <laughs> very interesting that the word to it like if somebody maybe had used another word or maybe explained uh -huh. it a little bit differently like it is crazy the power of some words oh, like absolutely. stemming on just that and you know everything may happen for a reason and so but it's it's very interesting because leg length discrepancy also like when one leg is shorter than the other if you've never heard that term before yeah. um can lead to like some limping when you're walking and did you notice any of that like did you feel like you were almost people describe it as like waddling because you're kind of like have more of a side to side motion no I really didn't I okay. I don't think my leg length discrepancy is that huge okay but um but there is a little bit of one and and they told me to wear a heel uh, uh, like a lift in my shoe for it. Yeah. Um, but no, it wasn't something that I noticed. But again, it's one of those things maybe that you just compensate for and you don't realize. Sure. That. And sometimes they're very subtle. And even if it's just a very small difference, you may not notice. But mm -hmm. then in other people, you may notice that it's pretty late, pretty, I mean, even like right. a quarter of an inch or something can be a lot. Um, so that is always kind of to, something to look at, um, especially if you do kind of feel like maybe you're in that like waddling type walking, or maybe you even do feel like one leg shorter than the other. But on the other side of this, 
some people do experience a leg length discrepancy after surgery. And so oh. that is, it, it's more common in hip replacements than it is knee replacements, but that is something to watch out for. Um, I would absolutely have someone assess your leg length just to make sure that there's not a discrepancy before going into this. Um, really all they do is measure um, but also kind of being aware of that after, because sometimes if they go untreated or unnoticed, that heel lift can be helpful, but if they go unnoticed, then it can start creating other problems. So that's just a caveat just to kind of watch out for um, with surgery. But like I said, more, more common in hip replacements than knee replacements, but definitely something to watch out for. So you did mention a lot of pain in other joints before this surgery. So how do you feel now? Because you are what? How many weeks out? I actually am 20 weeks. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I, about five yeah. months. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how yeah, is I all that pain? Months out. I had it December 20th. Oh, okay. Perfect. So how is all that pain now? Um, I still have a lot of neck pain. I, I'm actually having a nerve block injections done next week on my neck. Okay. And um, the lower back, though, has not seemed as problematic as it usually is. Okay. Um, I, I definitely feel that I'm getting so much stronger um, through PT and through doing your program. And um, I, I feel like that is better. Um, okay. So almost more confidence. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because if you go from like feeling like you're walking on eggshells to finally like, hey, exactly. I have this joint, this strong you know, joint. Yeah, that's funny you say that because I do feel more confident with stepping like out. And I noticed that the other day I was like, this knee feels so strong now. And I do feel like, I mean, um, I could do small hikes and that kind of stuff and, and build up to even, you know, more outdoor adventure type thing. Sure. And I know that you just went on an adventure to uh, overseas. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like the decision to go on that trip and how you kind of, then we'll talk about more of the intricate recovery okay. aspect of it. But um, how was that? Well, it was an amazing trip. Um, we went to England and Scotland and we first went to London. And I was really nervous before we went. We've been wanting to go for years. And of course, you know, for a couple of years, no one could travel really. So um, we didn't, that just put it off and it wasn't our choice. But, sure. but for now, I, I really wanted to go and I really wanted, it's an expensive trip and it's a time investment. Yeah. And um to, when we went, I was afraid that I, what if I can't do the things we want to do? We want to go to, you know, museums. We want to see all the sites. Right. We you want to get the park. most out of the trip. <laughs> exactly. You want to see it all. And, um, and I don't know when we'll be back. So, um, right, right. uh, yeah, I wanted to be able to do everything that we wanted to do. But I'm also, I was having to consider, you know, my husband, he, I want to be able to do everything he wants to do too. So I didn't want to get to a point where I'm saying he wants to go somewhere and I'm just like, I can't. Yeah. I mean, keeping I up people is a big part of, you know, a lot right. of the recovery aspect and exercising and things like that as a motivation. Sure. And I didn't want to be stuck in a hotel room either. I mean, right. not that he would go somewhere without me, he probably wouldn't, but, but I didn't want to hold him back and I didn't want to hold myself back too. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, I was really, um, as, as the trip got closer, I was wishing I had another month of PT and exercising to build okay. up because um, I was kind of feeling like I'm not quite there, but I, I think it was fine. I did fine. I was actually able to walk um, 20 to 25,000 steps a day. And, and I um, imagine a lot of stairs too. Oh my gosh, Edinburgh, stairs, <laughs> nothing but stairs. It is just <laughs> stair city and uh, just so incredibly beautiful. And I'm so glad. And we did a small hike actually in Edinburgh too. There's a little like 
mount I, I don't know if you call it a mountain in utah you probably don't call it a mountain <laughs> <laughs> Maybe but, uh, that's okay <laughs> it's it's uh it, it's a really pretty hike up to the top of this and it overlooks the bay and it's just so gorgeous oh, nice. the views from up there sure and i was kind of about halfway into that hike i was like I'm not sure I should be doing this, but you know, that determination just kicks in and I went with it. And we, we, even now we keep saying, I'm so glad we did that hike That's and, awesome. and it was fine. You know, it was just fine. The, the knees kind of ached at the end of the day. I was wishing I had my ice machine, <laughs> but um, other than that, it was fine. Did you notice any swelling at all? Not really, you know, my knees have never been that um, prone to swelling. Okay. I don't know why. Um, not a bad thing. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. I just, a lot of times they'll say, well, is it swelling? And I'm like, no, it, it really never swells. It swells a little, but yeah, um, but I didn't notice. It probably was a little swollen, um, but I didn't notice. But not to a limiting end. Because that right. can be a common thing after knee replacements for quite a while for a lot of people. If you do, especially a lot of activity, you may notice some swelling and things like that. Um, now, sometimes in the garden, I will, if I've done a lot out in the garden, that, okay. then I'll notice some stiffness. But that's, that's all it is for me. It's not like it doesn't swell up like a big balloon. It's just stiffness. Okay. Okay. And were you given, as far as the recovery aspect goes, were you given any um, guidance like before the surgery of here's what to expect, or, you know, this will likely happen, or here's what's going to happen after the surgery? Uh, a little bit. Um, okay. Some people aren't very good at that. So <laughs> I just, the, I'm the hospital had a kind of a clearance procedure and they had pamphlets that they gave you okay. and that kind of thing, things to watch for that would be an emergency if sure. you needed to come back in that kind of thing. Okay. And a lot of that is the, it kind of just glosses over you when you're pre surgery <laughs> And um, like one of the things um, was the instructions about getting the medications refilled. And um, oh. I, when I needed that, I didn't uh, remember that information. And so you, you're getting so much information thrown to you all at once. Um, I feel like it was pretty good as far as the knee itself, like what to expect and what to work for. Oh, okay, perfect, okay. Like like for infection or anything yeah. that would come up like that, so. Was, was there anything along this journey of recovery that surprised you at all? Oh, yes. <laughs> and this is so, the real stuff that people don't tell you. So. <laughs> yes, this, um, and, and you know, and anyone who's read my blog post, I have a blog post called New Year, New Knee, because- it I'll was, link that down below, yeah. Yes. And um, if you've read that blog post, you'll know that um, one of the, uh, the, the knee itself, the, uh, there wasn't any complication with the surgery as far as, you know, sometimes the surgeon comes out and tells whoever's waiting, oh, it, it was rougher than I thought, and this and this happened. And there was none of that. It was just... Okay. It must have just been the easiest surgery in the world. Pretty routine. Yeah. yeah. A lot of them yeah. are pretty routine. I mean, they bang out a lot of them in a day. So, okay. Yes. Yes. And so um, I kept a journal afterwards because I knew I wanted to write a blog post about yeah. the knee. And when I was rereading my journal and trying to get ready to write that blog post, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, there's nothing in here about my knee. This is all about how sick I was oh. from opio opioid induced constipation. And I Very was like, a lot of I had no idea. I had never heard of that. And uh, I had no idea that I could find myself feeling like in an emergency situation because of constipation. Yeah. And the thing is, is it's really embarrassing. I mean, you don't want to talk about constipation. Right, right. <laughs> and so but it's a very but, real thing that a lot of people go through. And 
yeah it's glazed over in the they just hand you the side effects of the medications and say oh here exactly. read exactly <laughs> like no one said this could be a very serious issue and this is the symptoms you need to look for and and they actually no one talked about it at all yeah and so on the third day um i actually did talk to my doctor about it and um he said well it's just something you're gonna have to tolerate because he emphasized that you need to stay on the opiates because without those, you would be in so much pain that you can't do your physical therapy. And, and yes, the physical therapy was so important because you want to get that range of motion back in mm -hmm. those first couple of days, the first couple of weeks. You, I, I, I was told, and of course you would know much better, that um, that can really set you know, where you're going to be way down the line. If you don't get it, then you're not going to get it. And it definitely is very important in the beginning. I think there's a lot of maybe over exaggeration of like really push through the first day or two um, where, you know, you do have a window of time where that can be, I mean, that you need to get at least most of the range of motion back. Um, but I mean, yes, it's very important, but I do think that right. you kind of press, put it like in precedence <laughs> over some of these other like important things. Like, uh -huh. So it's like, okay. <laughs> well, so the, the doctor was kind of like, well, you're going to have to, you have to take the opiates and you're having this reaction to them. Um, um, you're going to have to take stool softeners and laxatives and mm -hmm. try to find a balance for you to still be able to maintain that medication. And I, I could, I never did. I never could find a balance. I was so sick. And I honestly, I didn't even want to write that um, blog post because as I was starting to try to put it all together and write it, I was like, this isn't even about my knee. It's about constipation. And number one, I don't want to write a blog post about right. <laughs> and, and, um, you know, I thought this, this is not giving people the information they need, but then but I decided, it is. maybe it is, maybe this is something we need to be talking about when I actually finally, uh, cause I still didn't know, like the doctors just talked about the constipation, but he didn't really make it clear that the opiate medicine was mm -hmm. causing that yeah and uh, so i was kind of still in the dark about why am i so sick what is what is making this happen i was also very nauseous and um so i finally googled it and dr google helped me out there but <laughs> yeah. um, and that's the so thing that's just kind of disappointing about um the recovery aspect of when you're seeing a doctor or a surgeon, they do these surgeries so routinely, but there is not a lot of information. You don't get a lot of information right. about what to expect or these other things that are very common. Nausea and then constipation are two of the most common symptoms with opioids, especially if you've really never taken them before, or never really had like a major surgery. Um, what are some of the signs and symptoms that you noticed? of of the constipation uh -huh. of uh, well i felt um very full like the the first couple of days at the hospital and they were giving me some pretty good nausea medicines then yeah um because i would get i would start getting really sick and they'd give me the medicine and i'd just perk right back up yeah and so um I noticed uh, that I was super hungry at the hospital. So I was like even eating ravenously and, and the food was actually really good. Yeah. And so I was eating, you know, ordering my meals and eating them. And, um, and then when I got home, I just felt real like a fullness and like uh, just really bloated. And uh, I, I started actually getting a, a feeling like almost like a panicky feeling Oh. Um, when I, I felt like, oh my gosh, I've got, I can't eliminate and I, right, right. and I, and I started really panicking and there were a couple of times that I actually felt like I would have to go to the emergency room because of it. I mean, I felt like it was more than constipation. It was more like a bowel obstruction. Okay. And, and I was really concerned because 
I've always been uh, someone like I take probiotics and I eat healthy from the garden. And so I, I take like my digestion is important and I've studied a lot about it and how like the gut can have an effect on arthritis. And um, so I've always been like super aware and I really? like to keep a very healthy gut. And so then I was like, well, I don't know what to do. Do I take uh, psyllium husk, do I take my probiotic while I'm having this problem? And your kind of your first reaction would be like, yes, you need to get everything back to normal. But the problem is, is as I read from Dr. Google, not not from anyone who told me, is that um, the opiates actually stop the systolic action in your in your gut. Okay. And so if I'm taking all these fibrous things and also taking the probiotic that's helping create everything that needs to come out and there's no function for it to come out. Sure. You, you are in an emergency situation. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was really critical. Um, it was a huge part of my recovery. I felt sick all the time and I, Thought I was really afraid I would not be able to do the PT and um, it just it, it was horrible it was by far the worst part of the recovery was I can imagine. whole opiate thing yeah and that would definitely be one thing if you're listening to this right now and maybe considering a knee replacement or have maybe talked to somebody already about it it's these things to plan for and to have maybe a plan and action of what to do, you know, what to watch out for. Asking right. these questions can help you to be better prepared because they may not be said to you, or you may not be getting instructions about it, or it may be hidden in some, you know, 10 page pamphlet that you may exactly. not exactly read word for word in the fine print. Right. Um, as right. far as pain levels in the knee, aside from the um, other symptoms, how was that? post-surgery um, just kind of throughout the recovery yeah um it was the pain is really bad um the the first couple of weeks um you don't want to let uh, the, the the medication lapse you know because yeah. you just don't want to tolerate that kind of pain um there were lots of times where I was like wow is, was this really worth it Did, yeah I, I heard that a lot especially mm -hmm. um working with people, I'd come see people like the next day and I'm sure you had PT very shortly after, but mm -hmm. um, it was, it can be definitely very, but again, it's different for a lot of, diff it's different for everyone, but I've heard, especially compared right. to like a hip surgery, knee replacements do tend to be a little bit more intense pain-wise. Um, and, and I felt like, uh, I think I wrote in my blog post of kind of about where I started not feeling so much pain. And um, I, I think I went off the pain meds at about um, eight weeks, maybe seven or eight weeks. Okay. And um, so by then it's something that you feel like you can control with Tylenol yeah. instead of the opiates. And, um, but yes, in the beginning, um, like, like those days in the hospital, not days in the hospital, it's not even, I don't know if I spent 24 hours. Yeah, I spent 24 hours in the hospital, but, okay. but it's the next day at lunch that you're out of the hospital. So that time is not much, but they keep you so medicated. And, you're, and that nerve block wears off. Yeah, yep. exactly. The nerve block. Um, so you're kind of in this happy place at the hospital and then you come home and you kind of have to deal with it all. And uh, so that's, that's hard, but yeah, yeah it is a lot of I had a lot of people, particularly a lot of male patients who a lot of times in um, Ohio where I was working, they would send you home the same day. So you would be wow. home six to eight hours afterwards. And, you know, I'd come the next day and they're like, oh, I don't need a walker. I'm good. Like I can do this. <laughs> And then I go back like two days later because I'm like, trust me, you're going to need this. And it's like, oh my goodness, like it is like a switch that completely changes. So even if you feel invincible after the first 12, right. 24 hours, yes, exactly. It's just kind of delaying the, the, you know, <laughs> you're off your pedestal by the time you get home. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, so would you say that in the position you are now about six months out, would you say that it's worth it? Um, I, yes and no. Uh, yes, I would say it's worth it. Um, would I have it again is a question that I'm not sure I can answer. Okay. Um, if if you could tell me, and I'm not sure, I haven't done the research on it. I, I'm not sure if there are any alternatives to the opiates, um, but if you could tell me that we could get me to the point I am right now without having to be on those opiates or without having to suffer the, the what I suffered, um, then I'd say, yes, absolutely, I'd have it. But the thing is, is there's, there's things that come up that you, you don't even know to ask. And um, so you focus so much on should I have this surgery or not? I don't know. And you're just like in that limbo, but you never really say, am I a good candidate to even have surgery? Yeah. And I think that's an important thing to say first is um, because I do have some other conditions. I have uh, Meniere's syndrome, which is an inner ear thing. And I kind of wondered if maybe that is what made me so sensitive to the opiates, because I do get a lot of sickness from the Meniere's. And, um, you know, maybe if I had done some more research, I might come up with the conclusion that I'm not a person who should have surgery, if I can keep from it. Obviously, if it's life-threatening situation, I'm going to have surgery. But, um, but if it's an elective surgery, am I a good person to be having surgery? And then go from, should I do this surgery or not? And that's definitely very important. And it comes with a lot of, um, if you think about other conditions like diabetes, for example, you don't heal mm -hmm. as well. So the wounds may take longer. I've seen people whose right. you know, wounds have come open and oh, or they're gosh. having a lot of problems with swelling. If you know that you're a um, person that hangs on to swelling a little bit more. And so I think that's definitely an important thing. Um, also, if you've never taken opiates before, there are some alternatives and I cannot remember them off the top of my head. There are some alternatives that to opioids um, that you can definitely ask about if you're, you know, in, if you're fearful of the opioids or if you don't want to take them or having these issues, there are some other things they may not work quite as well. Um, but it's definitely a question that you can ask. Um, right. I would definitely ask that question. And um, actually my chiropractor said that he thought there was some genetic testing they can do to see how sensitive you are to opiates. Oh. I don't know if that's true or not, yeah, but, but I would ask my doctor that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely an important question where there, um, and I also think that it's important to know as far as the recovery goes, you become from the experience that I've had, you become pretty reliant on the help of other people for at least oh. like the first week to two weeks and if you live alone or if you maybe have kind of sporadic support from family or friends um it can be really hard because you can overdo it very easily in the first trying to do everything on your own right. and if you can just kind of speak to that experience a little bit because you really do need somebody there at least for the first couple of days kind of 24 7. Do. absolutely um just to get you home and and get you out of the car i mean if you had uber take you home i don't know <laughs> i don't know yeah, how I mean, you'd uh, even get seriously. in the house um, but definitely you rely, um, on your help a lot. And, um, and my husband was great and he, he did so much for me. Um, having, I, I almost think it, it would have been kinder to all of us had I split that up and had a neighbor or a friend and help like out with yeah. some of the, some of the other things just say, Hey, can you go get the medicines? Cause he, he had, you know, they would change medicines or try to fix something, or he had to pick up something else. And uh, so he was constantly running to the pharmacy and um, just little things like that. If someone else can take that load off of the person while they're still trying to get you meals and like he did the laundry and he, yeah. you know, he did all the stuff and 
very important. And I talk about this in my uh, blog post. So if you're considering a joint replacement, it's definitely worth a read because um, I talk about some of the everyday things like your dogs. And I have two big dogs. And uh, actually the occupational therapist gave me a great little tip on the dogs um, because I was afraid of the dogs tripping me jumping up in the or house. Or jumping on you and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so um, they had issued me the walker and I told her I was afraid of the dogs and because um, they're big dogs. And she said, actually little dogs can be more of a problem because they go in and out of your feet. Um, she said, but just take your walker when you get home and if they try to approach you they want to smell it and stuff like that and see what it is just slam it down a couple of times you make them scared of it. with it and then that way they just they just won't approach it so i did do that okay <laughs> but it can be the, a big problem yeah it can be and not just that but just the care of the dogs and yeah. um you know they they can cause things to happen that you didn't expect and uh, that kind of thing. And so, uh, yeah, I do talk about that some in the blog post, but um, yes, definitely it's, he stayed home from work probably, definitely two full weeks. And then he still had to drive me to physical therapy, which was twice a week. And um, even then it was like, oh gosh, could you just take me somewhere where I, out of the house, you know, right. I didn't feel very mobile. Um, as far as like, I know one day he took me uh, shopping and we just walked around the store and um, I didn't realize how in the house I know where everything is. So I didn't feel wobbly at all. But when I was in that store, I was like, I feel lightheaded. I f I'm so glad I have this walker because I feel like I'm going to fall over. Yeah. And um, you're just, you're more familiar with your surroundings and you can go anywhere, but sure. uh, in strange surroundings, you really need help. Yeah. So, And that know. definitely is a big integration that you definitely, and I always recommend, I mean, taking the walker out when you go anywhere unfamiliar for the, at least the first few times that you do, that is good and even then have it in your car in yes. case, even if you feel confident because it's the walking longer right. distances, it's all the things that you may, may encounter. Mm. Um, yeah. And I didn't start driving until after six weeks. So for six weeks, you're stuck. Yeah. either someone's got to take you somewhere or you're stuck in your house yeah so you do get a little stir crazy yeah I can imagine yes and these are a lot of the considerations that again you may not be totally um, you may not have a total understanding of in the some hospitals and things do like um, total joint replacement classes and things oh that would have been good yeah, because you don't get a lot of this information and um, even hip replacements too, you have to get a higher toilet seat and you may have done that already, like a seat in the shower, like these are all considerations that, you know, if you have a super small shower and the chair won't fit, then it's going to make it a little harder. So it's, yes. if you have stairs in your house, I've had people move to like the first floor of their house and even people that had to rent hospital beds because they couldn't bring the bed down. So there's a lot of definitely considerations and I'm sure that the blog post will help to highlight some of that. Um, but I also want to highlight again, the complexity of the decision because clearly there's a lot of things going on and it's not just give me a new joint I will recover and I will be good to go there are some people that do have residual swelling that may not ever completely go away some people that their knee is not the same after I've had a lot of people describe that the knee just feels foreign like it doesn't feel it does. part of your body and so I don't know if you have experienced that as well it is you definitely have a feeling of this um it's kind of a numbness but it's just like I don't I don't feel right there you know yeah and um, and that may continue to come back even after you know six months um because they do I mean cut in and mess around in there and so um that's another thing that I just it may not totally feel the same some people are like ah, no problem um I've also seen a few patients who have done both at once <laughs> and you I, have I one know. recovery but it's also much more extreme um yeah. Yeah. so 
I don't know if you could I, imagine getting both at once. <laughs> I can't. Um, and I, I did mention it to my doctor because they, they did clear me for both knees to be replaced. But um, so I was kind of like, are we doing both knees? He said, well, I don't do, he doesn't do both knees. He just A lot of people don't knees. recommend it unless yeah. you are like, you fit all of these criteria um, that, I mean, you have to have a lot going in your favor to be able to kind of come out on the other side, but there are people that do. And so, I mean, it's worth yeah. asking because you go through the recovery once, but, but that, really and that's kind of my goal right now is to um, not have another knee replacement. And yeah. so I feel like with, with the correction that they've made in this, correcting that deformity, um, <laughs> that um, I can rely on the strength of this knee to help me gain strength in the rest of the joints. Yeah. And I mean, it totally is possible. And that's a question I get all the time is, you know, can you avoid the other one or is it just inevitable? And there are, of course, a lot of different variables that go into it. Um, but as far as like gardening, staying active with that, with the um, arthritis adventure blueprint, just adding in variety. I mean, it sounds like you're on the right path as far as kind of that recovery aspect. One thing I did want to address though, gardening of course requires some kneeling. And I don't know if you've made some, you know, compensations and things along the way, but did they mention anything about kneeling to you? Um, it's funny because, um, what was I doing? I would say at about maybe eight weeks or so, I was doing some kind of exercise where I wanted to kneel. And so I put a pad under it and I was doing this at home. And so I said something, I had a doctor visit and I said something to him. I said that that was very uncomfortable. He, he said, it's, I said, is it okay to kneel? He said, it's okay to kneel. He said, it may not feel good, but it's okay. To, it's, he said, you're not going to do any damage to that joint. And then when I was in PT later and I said something about it, they were like, I wouldn't be kneeling. <laughs> So I kind of got Dang conflicting. <laughs> <laughs> you had me going and the surgeon was like, you're not going to cause any damage. Um, Cause it's actually funny because a lot of people are told that no more kneeling, like you cannot kneel, especially on that side. You can maybe go on the other side, but um, there's actually no research showing that kneeling is bad. Huh. It's also one of those things that of course you need to build up tolerance. Like the first few times probably will not feel great but you can build up some tolerance, maybe not going and kneeling on like a hardwood floor, like a tile, right. but on like a softer surface, working up some of that tolerance. It is possible, um, but a lot of people are just set off because you know they're initially told no kneeling. And a lot of times it comes from the surgeon. Unfortunately, it came from the PT today or when you saw them, but it, there's no research saying that it has, you know, it can cause damage. I'm, of course, if you fell kneeling or something like went down hard, right. or, you know, there are other variables, but just the act of kneeling likely may not cause damage if you're doing it correctly and working up to it. Well, later, later in my PT, like towards the end, they did ask me if I had any goals that they hadn't addressed. And I said, well, I would love to be able to kneel in the garden mm. and get back up. Right. <laughs> because, <laughs> because part of my problem with my hands and my wrist is I, over the years, I've been putting so much pressure because if I do get down, I push myself back up with my hands sure. and wrists. And so now I've got really bad arthritis in there. And um, so I said, I just, I just want to be able to kneel down and get back up without using my hands and wrists. So we actually worked on that and she started with uh, several stacks of the pads and we, you know, just started removing pads until I could get, so I was doing a really good exercise and I, and I'm still working on it. I, I can't just totally get down there and get back up yet, but that is a goal. Yeah. So, she did work so, you, with it. so can you kneel on that side now? I, it, it's not comfortable. I need a good pad. Okay. Yeah. It just hurts like the outside, if you can imagine. It's almost like if you it took a, a 
metal something or other and poked it against your skin, it's going to hurt, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I just feel like it's, it's too, almost feels jagged. Like it's poking my skin. Okay. Okay. So, but with a soft pad, I can. Okay. So there is hope you can is continue hope. to kind of improve the tolerance of it. And it does depend on the hardware and all of that. Um, so any final words to wrap this up of somebody who's either listening or watching on YouTube um, of maybe just kind of some words of wisdom. Uh, we talked about a ton of stuff today to just kind of wrap up if they're considering a joint replacement. Well, I, I do hope it's, it's given them, your listeners some clarity and it probably has made it more confusing. I hope not, but um, it, there's so much to consider and um, a lot of times um, you're considering whether or not to have the surgery but again maybe you should consider is surgery going to be right for me <clears throat> i wish that um, when you made the decision like like i've made a decision now that i'm not having knee surgery on my left knee and i want that to be a permanent decision sure but it's not as permanent as if you make the decision to have surgery, because once you have it, you can't unhave it. So um, that's the hard part, I think, about if you make the decision that you're not going to have it, you need to be really committed to that decision. Yeah. Um, because it's it's too uh, it's too ambiguous. Like you could still have it, even though you made the decision not to have it. Sure. But if you had it, you can't still unhave it. So yeah, um, um, I don't know. I, I would just say, um, do you have to do what's right for you. And uh, I, I feel like with the strength that I'm feeling from this knee, and maybe it's not, maybe you said, like you said, it's more my confidence than the actual knee surgery. Um, if, if you could implant that confidence into my head without doing the knee surgery, <laughs> that'd be awesome. <laughs> yes. but, um, I do feel so much stronger and, um, and I still do my PT exercises a couple of times a week and uh, they do get a little boring though. And that's something I love about your program um, is- We gotta progress. We gotta it progress. focuses on different things and different areas of the body to strengthen and stuff. And so I do feel myself getting so much stronger and um, I feel like I can kind of meet some of these goals. Sure. That is also one thing I got a lot of questions about, you know, do I have to do these PT exercises like for the rest of my life? The answer is yes. If you get a knee replacement, you better start enjoying movement. Even if you don't enjoy it, you have to be consistent with it because these, if you don't get the full range of motion or don't get the full strength back, your pain could come back. And then the surgery is right. kind of useless sometimes. And, and that's, that's one thing that motivates me. I feel like, um, what is the point of going through all that? Right, all you that. went through a lot and- <laughs> I went through a lot. And not only did I go through it, but I was not available to help care for my grandkids. And right. I wasn't you available out. to uh, do the things. And, and my husband had to completely displace his schedule to be able to do what he did for me. So why would I go through all that if I'm not gonna use this bionic knee to its exactly. fullest potential exactly. and the only way I can use it to its fullest potential is to do the exercises and one thing is you know when I went to PT I have a little like uh, agenda that I would schedule my PT on and I it highlighted different colors so for medical appointments I always highlighted yellow so that I'd really make sure I saw that so um since I've not since I'm not going to PT anymore, I actually book my appointments on my agenda and for exercise. Yeah. And I highlight them yellow because it's not exercise because someone said I need to go exercise. It is a medical appointment that I'm making with myself to keep my body stronger. Yeah. And I love that. And that's, what's going to produce the optimum results. Now, one caveat too: do I have to do PT exercise for the rest of my life? they don't have to be the same ones. 
there are right. so many different ways to progress. There are so many different ways to make it more fun. You don't have to do just the knee bending and straightening, you know, for the rest of your life, you can do other things. So yes, you have to do some aspect of movement, but it doesn't particularly have to be the same, like piece of paper or something that you've got. Right, exactly. Um, I, I have definitely graduated from those pieces of paper yes. and, um, <laughs> Um, I, I was doing the PT like three times a week or in the beginning, I did it five times a week. And then I did it three times a week and I alternated your program two times a week. And now I've flipped that over because a lot of what I'm getting from those old PT exercises, I'm actually, what you're doing is a progression of that. Sure. So and if I know, want to get I back to higher level things, it's we have to continue to progress. And I get a lot of questions about, you know, is the arthritis adventure blueprint appropriate after surgery? Of course, once you're cleared from like outpatient physical therapy or cleared, you know, from the surgeon, whoever does it, hopefully it's a PT of some sort, but then you can start moving into some higher level type things. Um, although right. it does start out seated, but, um, to kind of, so you can keep progressing. And so, yes, you can, yeah. whether you have a knee replacement, a hip replacement, after you're cleared and have pain and everything under control, moving into something like that could definitely be beneficial. And I'm gonna link your blog post down below. So if you're on YouTube, it'll be okay. in the show notes. And then if you're on the podcast, it'll be down in the description. Um, I'll also link your Instagram. So it's at disabled gardener. Yes. On Instagram. Um, and you can follow her. She posts so many cool things. She posts a lot of pictures from her um, trip, which looked amazing. And then also lots of important things about gardening if you have arthritis. Um, and we also did a video. It was a few months yes. ago now that I will also link down below. It was a combination video of um, gardening with arthritis. Yes. So thank you so much for being here. I know this was a little bit lengthier, but I do hope that this did, like Dina had mentioned, bring some clarity, give you some ideas of questions to ask, and also just lay down some expectations of what you can expect. Again, everyone's situation is going to be different, but just some things so they don't come up as surprises because nobody likes surprises, especially after a right. major surgery. <laughs> so hopefully we've kind of cleared some of that up. Um, and thank you again so much for your time. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for all your work you do. It is so yes. important and this arthritis community really needs what you're doing right now. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thanks for listening and I'll see you on the next episode.